You've been in business here for many years. I've been here now, I would say, about 46 years in the square in Nungarvan. Uh, previous to that, I was in London. But I started off in Waterford uh, 51 years ago. On March 23rd, I was 16 on March the 20th and uh, started hairdressing. At that time, a fee had to be paid, 100 guineas. My parents had to beg, steal and borrow uh, to get me in there. I was supposed to qualify within two years. But when the two years were up, I found I wasn't learning that much. I knew I had to go to London, but I was one of the lucky ones. I had aunts in London around Cricklewood and uh, they had a nursing home and uh, they were able to put me up and um, I was able to further my education. Um, after 12 months there, um, my sister had this place here and uh, she was having her second baby. So I came home then um, to uh, help out and went back to London then and ended up in Vidal Sassoon's. My aunts paid for that, an awful lot of money at the time. I did a um, six months advanced course on cutting and when my time finished there, I was about to take a test and work for them. They had three salons. One was in the Grosvenor House, one in Sloan Street, and the other was in um, New Bond Street. So um, I got on very well with all of them. I used to go in on Saturday morning and work free for half the day learning. And I used to go to, um, they ran a school in each of the salons two nights a week, and I used to pick one of them and go there, I was made more than welcome. Uh, if you were interested in your work, you got on very well with the Sassoons. That's how they wanted. And this was in the 60s, yeah? Um, this, I was born in 1950, went to London in 68, 69. So this is the height of all the 60s. Oh my God, it just, it was all happening then. In actual fact, when I came back here to Ireland, I was one of the first to introduce blow drying in the south of Ireland. That's now how a new blow drain was. Sassoon's um, method and techniques of cutting, sure they were world, worldwide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you, if, you, if you qualified with Sassoon's, you could get a job any place in the world. Wow. They were crying out for students that just qualified there. And like, that was started when hair, hairdressers became like a major fashion, you know, well, like up, and exactly. Like up to the time I came home in Ireland, it was nearly all um, setting hair, rollers, and um, which never went out, of course, but Sassoon introduced something totally different. He was able to cut styles, and all the women needed was wash the hair, comb and shake it, and it fell into place. So he was absolutely, he was the, he was the world's best. So you're at the right place at the right time? The right place, right time. I was so lucky that my aunts had the money and um, they were so generous and decent that um, apart from putting me up and get funding me, um, they paid a lot of money to um, have me do um, uh, a six months advanced course on cutting. Yeah. And I loved it. It opened a new chapter in my life. Uh, I had to retrain when I went there because they held the scissors totally different to what I trained in Ireland. Totally different. Yeah, they used this finger here, uh, you know, with uh, holding the scissors. And um, this one we trained in Ireland, the index finger holding it. But um, they reckon you had more control over your scissors, you know, when you held it with this finger. And did you meet any, any famous people in the, in the no, Not really, only himself, because we were in the school of hairdressing. And I wouldn't have been too familiar uh, with um, uh, the people that were uh, coming to the salons. You know, we had a lot of models ca coming in because they were getting their hair uh, cut for little or nothing. You know, oh, beautiful, beautiful women. Was there walking advertisements? Uh, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone spoke about Sassoon's cutting at the time. And can we go right back then to where you started off from? Because you, you said you're originally from Kilmac Thomas. I was born and reared in Kilmac Thomas. Yeah, so could you tell us something about your family, your family origin? Well, my, my dad came from the Cumber Mountains, where I've settled now. I'm living up there now. And um, he came from um, uh, a farm up there. He had a brother, a priest. And um, 
his brother then one uh, he, did, it was very sad now their family they, an awful lot happened his dad died um, coming from a funeral getting out of the back of um, a pony and, and trap um, he was with his brother I suppose they had a few drinks and whatever but the pony lunged forward when he was stepping back and he fell back and split his skull in the road I think he was around 37 there was a, um, a little boy died then. He was swinging on a gate, the iron gate, I think. He's still in the home place. The gate fell on top of him and killed him stone dead. There was a little girl died then. She died of meningitis. She was two and a half, I think. And then my uncle William, I'm called after him, um, he died at 37. They said he wasted away. That's what they said at the time, I suppose. It was cancer maybe or whatever. Yeah, um, my mum then was from Kilmeade and she was power and um, she was the local maternity nurse in Kilmac Thomas. She had a wide area, Kilmac Thomas, Radbelly, Rackarmick, you know, down nearly as far as Kilmeade, up, ne- up as far as the Pike. And so was it that time, it was all home births? Home births at the time and she never lost a baby, never lost one, there you go. Yeah, but she was so she was so good to people and very very you know excellent at her job. She was really you know she, she was known you know throughout the county. And as a child, would you have seen Dungarvan as your kind of main became? Um, my mum used to shop in Waterford uh, on a Saturday, and then she seemed to change to Dungarvan. There was um, a shop across the way, Jimmy Mountain. I think Jimmy played for Waterford, played hurling at one stage. But I don't know if anyone said it to you already, but on the other side of the square, you had mountains, you had hills, and you had greens, all on the one side of the square. Were you told that already, no? Go on, go on. Yeah. So um, Jimmy Mountains, anyway, that's where my mum used to win, and Jimmy and his son worked the shop, got all her groceries there. Would you remember William as a child? I wouldn't. Oh yeah, I I was brought I was brought to carry all the shopping. I said that. that was my job. <laughs> you, you know, if we went to Waterford or Dungarvan, I was brought to carry. I was the only boy. I had three sisters, one older, two younger. The older one was a hairdresser, and the younger one, and the one next to me, then she went nursing. Ended up in London. She's living in Ealing now. And, and you, when, you, when you came to Dungarvan as, as a child, what was, did you, was your family, did they have a farm? Or, or? No, um, my dad came from a farm, okay. Um, he worked in the creamery in Mahan Bridge as a clerk. So, but uh, all I can remember when I was young, my parents were always working. When my mum used to come in, she was always washing, ironing, baking, fantastic at baking. After a dance, our house would be full. She had scones and she had this big dish of apple turnover, sponge on top, apples underneath. And my father would hear the commotion then about three o'clock in the morning, he'd come down and he'd clear the house, saying, feck off home for yourselves there. Everyone here has to get up early for work, you know, clear the lot. <laughs> Great fun, absolutely brilliant fun. See, with the dance hall in Kilmac, you know, the Rainbow Hall, all the big bands used to come there. You know, with a great upbringing. I used to do a lot of fishing when I was young as well. In And I still do. I used to do a bit of shooting then as well. And so. And, and uh, when you said your sister became a hairdresser. Yeah, she started before me. She, she, only, she had to pay 50, 50 pounds to train. I had to pay 100 guineas. And I had a cousin in Kilmeadon. She had to pay 75. I had a cousin in England... I don't know what he paid, but he gave it up anyway after um, when he was nearly qualified. But where did that tradition come from, then, the family? I don't know. Um, like, uh, we were all um, artistic in a way, you know. Um, I, I used to make a lot of money when I was very young. I used to, my mother had seven sisters, one brother, but I used to make all my own Christmas cards, uh, draw and paint them. And uh, I used to always write to my favourite aunt, and they were in England and America, and I used to get a load of money from them. But I often wondered, as I got older, if they were ever visiting at Christmas, and they say, gee, this, this fella called me his favourite aunt, and you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, but, uh, so it was just basically an artistic family? Yeah, I would say so. I've 
two daughters then and them, both of them would be very artistic as well. One of them, I think her paintings, they were hanging up in the Mercy for a long time. She was absolutely excellent, brilliant. Both of them are in Dublin now. And then when you came back, well, first of all, when you went to London, was it, like, was it a big shock coming from Kilmack? I cried every Sunday night. I did, yeah. Um, I missed the soccer in Kilmack, playing on the team. I missed the old dances and I missed, missed all my friends. Totally different. 18 years of age, you know, ended up. I know I was lucky to be with my aunts, but um, you're on your own still, you know. And was there, was there a Dungarvan crowd in London that time that you used to meet up with? No, no. I didn't know of any of them to know where they were. I wouldn't have known anyone hardly from Dungarvan then, okay. you know. So, then I got used to it. You know, you make some friends eventually and everything works out well, okay. you know. But I, at, at the time, I think I came home against my will um, when my sister Marion was given up here. And um, my mum said, would you not come home and try it out? And I said, no. I said, the type of work that I've learned with the Sassoons would not go down in Dungarvan. And uh, how wrong I was. You know, eventually the whole thing kept going. And, um, you know, it was a, a great move. And I loved it. And what was your, when you came back to Dungarvan first, to, to the square, what was it like then, that stage? What was your memory of it? <coughs> um, Dungarvan was... Uh, it would be a, a traditional, um, I suppose, country town, a market town. Um, people come in shopping from all over. Uh, when I started here, it was quite enough. You had um, two pubs beside me uh, here. There, were, there was a load of pubs in Ungarvan, and a lot of them sold groceries as well. Um, all the old, all the old um, shops are gone now, I suppose. Um, Corns, they're... Um, they're, they're still operating there, Mrs. Corn, And um, Tynan's, of course, the Enterprise, they're there all the time. And uh, they took over from their dad, whereas uh, I took over from my sister Marion. But I started off a different trend and a new clientele altogether, you yeah, know. So, so the, the old, I say, the old guard was kind of finishing up, I suppose, probably when you... I would say so. Um, when I came back here first, there was only three other yeah. salons in Dungarvan. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what we did then, um, we started off and I did up the place and um, we got it going well. I had uh, maybe five or six employed. Then eventually um, we bought the premises about 30, 31 years ago and we gutted the whole place and redid the whole place up then and i ended up at 14 of his staff for years now we're down to about five five or six yeah 14 of his staff yeah you see overhead we have another salon so i uh, this is the one plan that i had in mind if we ever bought the place to take away part of the ceiling so you have a big open plan because i worked in places where um it was so hot in the summertime, whereas now I can open a door upstairs, open the front door, and you have a flow of air going through the whole time. Yeah. But uh, nowadays, you have about 24, 25 salons between Dungarvan and Abbeyside. Yeah. So. The start was only three. Three salons, yeah. I can hear, do you know when people came in first back in? I suppose that, that early 70s. So early yeah. What, what were the haircuts? Like? For the name, for the name. Well, when I, when I came back from London, um, Sassoon's had introduced the bob, number one, which is still most popular today. See, a lot of women, they wear the bob. It's cut around here, the front of it dipping down. Then uh, they were, Sassoon's then, they had a, a short haircut uh, called the moosh. They had, if you brought it back then, that was, the, that was the basic short haircut. And then if they brought it back, it was called the breeze. Then they had different styles, like uh, an Isadora. They had it like a, a long page by. They're all different, different names and different styles. Yeah. And what about, you know, when you came into Dungarvan first? Yeah. Like, I presume a lot of the men were reluctant to come in here. Right? Well, at that time, um, fellas were starting to, what, they wanted their hair styled. Whereas we'll say the ladies' hair, hairdressers, hairstylists there, they were the only ones really at the time. The barbers were still on short back and sides. You now they were gifted in their own rights, but that's the way they had trained. 
you know. Um, whereas we um, in Sassoon's, we did ladies and gents restyling, all restyling. At the time then, the trend was for um, young hairs like ourselves, we all left our hair grow, but to a stylist was long, you know. And uh, made it very. I remember in the square when they used to have the markers and fair. I remember the, the, the fairs in Ungarvin, yeah. You'd have, um, you'd have cattle right outside the door here. See, we went to school in Ungarvin, you know, and um, on a fair day. We, we actually had a fair day in Kilmac as well. I remember finding there was a, a, a young lad down in Kilmac in my class, Johnny Power. It was on a Friday and there was a fair day in Kilmac, place to be mobbed. And we found, I found a bundle of money, I mean, a bundle of it. And uh, gave it up to the nuns and they said, bring that down to the, the guard of barracks there. Sure, I never heard anything after about it, after handing it in. Yeah. But anyhow, I suppose at the time you wouldn't expect it either, you know. So in the garden, when, when you moved up here, and during the fair days, was it kind of mayhem? Or was it... It, it would have been, but then again, they were well able to look after their stock out there. They were, you know. I, I can't even remember the year they stopped now. But um, you would, and you had the hawkers yeah. then in Dungarvan. They had the whole square taken up right outside our door here. You had their kind of tents going along there, their stalls, you know, with all the clothes and all that. And what was it, the horse fair? Was that the old school? Um, the horse fair then used to be out in the square. I remember trying to get my uncle uh, up, up in Cumber to buy a horse for me at one stage. Sure, it was ridiculous because uh, we couldn't um, look after him. Well, I wouldn't been in Kilmac Thomas and I'd say my mother wouldn't have had time or my dad to drive me up every evening to ride a horse <laughs> but we uh, isn't it funny uh, we bought one for our kids then when they were young living up in Comer we're lucky enough we purchased some land up there and our house on 12 acres so we were able to keep a pony for them and do you think that people in the garden do you think they appreciate the fact that the mountains are so close and, and I would, oh I would say I'd say people in Dungarvan are very proud of um, being living on the seaside and be able to go up then like up to Mahan Falls that's where we are I'm about three minutes from Mahan Falls and um, the Mahan Falls now sure my god the amount of people up there sure now you have the greenway as well greenways after but they still love the mountain and the walk out to the Mahan Falls Fantastic. I used to cut turf up there with my, with my dad. Um, <coughs> I remember we had friends down uh, one weekend. Um, they were staying in Nongarvan. And uh, we were having a drink with them on Sunday night. Uh, my wife and myself came in to meet them. And uh, I was after being spreading turf and getting it ready with my father. And it was dry and we had it in bags at the time. And uh, when we came in having a drink... Over the course of the night, one of them said, my God, we had a great day. We're out to Mahan Falls today. We actually swiped two bags of turf. And I said, where exactly did you get those? And I said, you know, you just park there and you walk in towards the Mahan Falls and on the left there. Sure, they were all mounted up there. Which I, I said, there we went to my dad when he nearly fell off the seat. <laughs> but my dad wouldn't mind. He didn't mind at the time. Yeah. I know, it's so funny, yeah. Talk about walking into it. <laughs> but anyhow. And, and, uh, what occasions would you remember in the square over the years? Um, well, I suppose when I was younger, the gala week. Because we had an old Kyoto's band in Kilmac Thomas. And uh, we used to play in the gala week up here, you know. And we actually had two bands. And we used to be on um, Seamus Ennis, which was... Um, I used to be on half five on a Saturday evening on RTE, yeah, Seamus Ennis. So we played in that a few times. And uh, we used to go off to the flag always. And uh, <coughs> we had a great time. Then we used to band practice off and down in our own house in Kilmac Thomas, about 14 of us inside playing music. And my father would be trying to get us going on it and keeping us quiet and trying to concentrate. I played the harmonica at the time. I used to play a mandolin as well um, in later years. It was never much. He was excellent. You see, the, the home my dad came from, 
he's he 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 my granny taught all the local kids free of charge of course there was no money involved then taught him how to play music and set dancing she was famous for this camera set that she invented i think this camera set and also they used to play cards it was a kind of um an open house if you like big big cement floor uh, in the kitchen there and that's for the dancing pardon my granny's name minnie and they all called her aunt minnie yeah, even the older people now that are left, they'd say, I remember Aunt Minnie well, your granny. Yeah. And they all got tea before they finished. Then um, my uncle then that was looking after the farm, uh, Uncle Nicholas, um, he got a job in London. And the morning he was to leave, he, they, were work, they got a job in a pub. Uh, what was it called? Um, well, I'll think of it after a while. Because we belonged to Hills in Kilmac. They had a pub in London. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. And um, the morning he was to leave with uh, the next door neighbour, John, John Welch. Um, they were all Welches, of course. Our crowd were known as the Bill Jacks in Cumra. Then uh, they all had different names. Otherwise, the postman wouldn't know where the letters were to be delivered. But anyhow, my father took the ticket and went instead of him because the granny asked uh, the uncle you know the, the farm had fallen apart if you go do not stay but he came home then when war, the war broke out and stayed and then he had a horse he bought a horse and they were sliding turf from the the Cumber mountains there was over a hundred i think working uh, for um um was it pat for michael keating because he um was the owner of the bog that's still out there on the way out to the Man Falls. So there was loads of people uh, uh, cutting turf, spreading it, and my father had a job of sliding it. Sliding. They put all the turf on this, um, I suppose, it was like galvanized or whatever it was at the time, and that was tied onto the horse, and they were able to slide it down then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, to, to bring it down, yeah. Out of the bog. Yeah, sliding it. Yeah. Well, I, did, did you ever hear the Magic Road? Yes. Yeah, the Magic Road. Well, we were filming out there, and tis, I'd say tis, we made it famous there. That should was in trouble. Um, we thought of a scene there. I used to be of May at home, and I was saying to the two lads, the two, the two coffee boys, two brothers, I said, May, I said, if you sit up on the bike and put your legs out, that the bike will go up the hill for you. And uh, it did. It went straight up the hill. So I, it's an optical illusion, but if you look at it, you actually think a car is rolling up the hill or a bicycle. So since then, people came from all over to see it. There was. Yeah. Well, my father was telling me a story one time that himself and his mother, my dad was the youngest now. He was actually born three months after my granddad died. Three months after. So he was spoiled, of course, there. And... Um, they went visiting, or rambling as they used to call it, one night to a neighbour's house. And on the way back, pitch black, winter's night, they could hear the sound of chains rattling. And every time they'd hear, they'd run back. But eventually, the granny picked up enough courage to keep going. But the following day, when my father was going out across to one of the neighbours for something, two goats were tied with two chains. They were chained together. So a lot of ghost stories you hear, there's always an explanation. You know, the Banshee, of course, then, was another one. And then Jackie the Lantern, a light in the bog. You know, all this. But there was a great story told. Um, I had a granduncle, or a great gran I had a granduncle, a priest, and a great granduncle. And he was based in London, when people were very, very poor. And he got a sick call one night. And this old lady gave directions to go to this house. My mum was telling me all this there years ago. So when he got to the house anyway, went upstairs and on the way in, there was a picture on the wall of a lady. And he went in and he anointed the lady that was dying. And she said to him, Father, can I ask you? She said, who called you for me? And he said, in actual fact, was 
that picture on the wall, the lady and that. Oh, that's my sister. She's dead 10 years. We always said whoever would die first would call the priest for the one that was left. That was a true story, you know. Yeah, true story. So, yeah. That's um, a long, long time ago. The creamery, I'd say, the creamery. Uh, two of my granduncles were part of the five or six or seven people that started the creamery. Yeah, they were Beresfords, two of them. So um, <coughs> that's come back a long time ago. Um, yeah, they were very proud of that, they were, you know. I mean, the, the creamery really took off. Sorry, excuse me a minute. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> but anyhow, I have a bad chest. <laughs> but um, yeah, they, they were um, two of the founder members of it. So, it's a bit of history there as well. Would you remember going in there? I remember going into the creamery, yeah, different times. Or being nosy, I suppose, as children. We go in and have a look around, you know. Until you got caught and hunted out of it. Yeah. Busy place going back then. And then what about the, the leather factory? The leather factory. My, my father-in-law worked in the leather factory for years. He was a foreman down there. Yeah. Peter Maloney. And that was really tough work, wasn't it? It, it was, he did mostly nights down there. And, um, but he was well respected. Very, very fair. Anyone that worked under him, they always said... A very, very fair person and a lovely man. And the, 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 the port, I mean, the harbour and all that was very busy at one time. Well, when, I was, when we were young going to school, um, we could always remember the ships in there, of course, going down to have a look at them. And they were unloading coal and fertiliser, I think, and timber, all different things that were, I suppose, brought in from other countries. But it was a sight to behold, see them. And now and again, you'd get one and uh, they'd, they'd get stuck on, um, uh, 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 on the, out near the Cunninger. There was a bank of sand out there. If they came in the wrong way, they got stuck on that. They could be there then for, until you get a high tide, you know, to yeah. get them off that. And, and you said you're into fishing yourself. Yeah, I love it. And where would you go fishing? Um, I do a lot of salmon fishing on the Blackwater. Um, up um, near Ballyduff Upper, uh, around there, above and below the bridge. I do a bit of lake fishing as well. Okay. well I've been fishing since I was a, a child. My older sister Marion and myself used to go down the Mahon River when we were very, very young, bring down a sandwich, and my mother used to make homemade lemonade. And we'd have that with us, be down all day. And you know, you're safe then. Different times, and it was lovely. We loved the river. Yeah. Would you upset salmon or would you... No, no, no. Um, one time I used to get quite a lot of them, but uh, they were more plentiful then. I used to get on average around 40 a year uh, in, during the season. But then by the time you give them to your family and friends, you know, there was always a handout looking for some. You're always popular. Yeah, yeah, but um, it was lovely though to be able to give a fresh salmon to someone. Oh. We didn't appreciate it that much ourselves. So this year, my numbers are way down. But I got uh, a very big one there, which I hadn't got for about 25 years. He was over 14 pounds weight. Wow. Got to send him off to be smoked. Yeah. Was that in the black water? In the black water, yeah. And do you think it's improved in the game? Um, it, this year seemed to be a better year than other years, but it was just hard luck on me, I suppose, that I wasn't meeting fish. A lot of my friends were getting a nice, nice food, you know. But you have to respect the sport as well. You have to return, you know, some, you know, so, like, you can't keep killing the whole time. You have to respect it, even on lake fishing now. Like, uh, you're supposed to just keep two. I've often been out there with friends of mine, and we wouldn't keep any, return them all, mm. you know. And the same, if, if the salmon is in the river a few weeks there, you'd, you'd notice him, he'd start to lose that real silver colour, and uh, we'd always put them back, give them a chance then to spawn. And there's a great feeling about releasing a salmon. Just a fantastic feeling, you know. And how do you, I mean, just about Don Garvin itself now, I mean, it's after getting a, I suppose, a re... A, a, a revamp. <laughs> yeah. Um, at the time it was going on, um, all businesses were very, very badly affected. 
like um, people couldn't get into our salon here because they had barriers across the way and a lot of our clientele would have been old enough and uh, you'd be depending on those people and when they couldn't walk in or park outside we lost a lot of them now some of them have returned but um, it had a massive effect on business in town but then again it looks lovely now and it's very much ad admired so it's worth it all so it's in the fit. Oh my God, the Greenway. It's absolutely fantastic for the town. I mean, any given day during the summer, you can see bicycles every place, outside restaurants and all that there, coming in for a bite to eat or, you know, taking a break and then heading off again. And sure, it goes all the way to Waterford. Mm -hmm. Just brilliant. Great. William, thanks very much for doing the interview. You're more than welcome, Molly, and lovely meeting, you know. And uh, thanks to your cameraman as well. Thanks for everything. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Well done, lads. Sorry.